Hey, good afternoon, everybody. This is Frank Quinn from Heritage, Ohio. Welcome to our monthly webinar. Our monthly webinars, we typically do these as a benefit of membership, but sometimes we do a webinar that is set up and we allow anyone to register and attend. And this month is one of those cases because we feel this is a very important topic and we want to get the word out to as many people as possible. So as you can see from your screen, we are talking about windows today. It's the eyes of a building. And for our special guest, we have Christina Damshin. She's the Director of Marketing at Indo. Uh, in case you're not familiar, Indo is a storm window company uh, based out of the West Coast that supplies storm window inserts. And that's great when you have an old building with historic windows, original windows, and you want to save your windows, but you don't want to freeze in the winter. Uh, let me tell you a little bit more about Christina. She's been with Indo for five years, uh, working with consumers, commercial projects, and is now the director of marketing. She created and runs the Window Hero webinar series. I hope you've had a chance to attend some of those if I, as I have. They are a great webinar series. She also runs their affiliate program and sponsorships of historic networks. Prior to working with Indo, Christina was a marketer for renewable energy and was a controller at an art auction house. So before I turn the mic over to Christina, um, we have AIA continuing education credits for you CE hungry architects out there. So I have a little bit of information to share with you. And that information is that this course is registered with AIA CES for continuing professional education. As such, it does not include content that may be deemed or construed to be an approval or endorsement by the AIA of any material of construction or any method or manner of handling, using, distributing, or distributing or dealing in any material or product. This session is registered for one HSW credit. So at the end of this course, participants will be able to learn about the beauty and integrity of original windows, learn about energy efficiency improvements for historic windows, learn about advocacy strategies to help preserve historic windows, and learn why historic windows are superior in quality and lifespan to replacement windows. So if you're going for AIA credit, don't forget to email Devin here in our office at officemanager at heritageohio.org to receive credit in your completion certificate. So I will turn this over to Christina. If you have questions as Christina is talking, feel free to type them into the question box. At the end of Christina's presentation, we will go ahead and do our Q&A session. So without further ado, I will turn it over to Christina. All right, thank you, Frank, and thanks everyone for attending today. I'm really excited about this because as Frank mentioned, I've been doing a Window Hero webinar series uh, for a few years now that works with window preservation uh, professionals to talk about how to make window preservation more approachable. And we've posted these videos on YouTube um, to try and engage directly with um, communities, but it, it's still online. And so I think this presentation is going to be really important because it says, how can we as a business and an organization work together to engage communities on a local level to make them truly understand the value of why they might want to consider uh, window preservation in the first place? Um, the, the battle is certainly not over in terms of uh, making sure people understand why window replacement is going to vastly change the appearance of their community. And uh, I think this will be a great tool for you guys in starting that discussion. Um, we will have a Q&A session at the end, and I'm looking forward to hearing from you all um, 
you know, your perspective on a local level. So I, again, just to reiterate some of the objectives that Frank mentioned, we're going to talk about value building events about window preservation and, and starting this conversation and continuing it through a lot of the efforts that you're already doing um, in the preservation space. But we also want to talk about um, some arguments that people pose as to why they want to replace out the windows and make sure that they have the resources and uh, knowledge available to make a, a full assessment if that truly is the best decision for their building or if a simple rehabilitation can make their windows operable and efficient. And then finally, we have a very exciting campaign that we are launching with Heritage Ohio that, that furthers that opportunity I spoke of, of businesses and nonprofits working together in their communities um, to, to try and further this conversation around how we can make uh, preservation approachable. So to get started, why do historic windows matter in the first place? Well, first and foremost, they are made with durable old growth lumber. Uh, this wood is tight grain and harder than a lot of the woods that we can find today. And oftentimes people were even cutting down trees in their local area, and sometimes even on the property to fabricate the windows. That's just simply not found anymore. Um, especially if you're looking at a vinyl replacement window, which wouldn't be made of, of wood at all uh, and poses some uh, environmental threats as vinyl produces a lot of dachshunds uh, when it is produced uh, into the atmosphere. There, it, it's also just irreplaceable. It's centuries old wood that is very rare to find these days uh, and, and we don't want to lose that. Old windows also have handmade wavy glass. Uh, it's interesting. I've heard so many different urban lift, uh, myths across the years as to why glass is wavy. I think one of my favorite ones I've heard is that uh, the lead in the glass is heavy. And so over the years, it uh, gravity takes hold and it sinks and it causes ripples. Uh, that is not true. It's uh, about just the process in which it's made. Glass was something that was hand blown. It was put into these big um, cylinders and then cross cut to get the sheets. And uh, that manufacturing process had some impurities in it. So you'll see bubbles and different characteristics that are unique to that process. We've now switched to something called float glass. And that's when you take a raw material, heat it up, put it into sheets and you can mass manufacture it. It was really great because it enabled us to uh, really reduce the costs of uh, glass manufacturing, but we no longer have those special characteristics. And I think when we do have a space with windows that uh, have those traits, it's something that we need to preserve. Uh, and that speaks to the irreplaceable historic character in our neighborhoods. We don't want to lose that. And we have to constantly be thinking of years down the line when someone is coming uh, into their neighborhood, what's their perception? Should it be when the house is originally built and they see all these tiny little details that make it unique to the time it was constructed? Or do we want to leave traces of the here and now when we made a rash decision to replace it out um, for, for needs that weren't really fully thought through? And this is kind of a long slide, but it speaks to that point, and I think it's really important. So apologies that I'm going to actually read from this long slide, but I, I think it's uh, vital. Uh, Steve Jordan, who is the author of Window Sash Bible, he did a great uh, webinar with us, which I encourage you guys to watch. Uh, but when we were interviewing him um, for an article around the webinar, he said this. When I travel now, I still want to go on back roads. I like the so-called blue highways. Nothing thrills me more than to drive through a village that I've never seen before or see something that I haven't seen before, like a type of architecture or maybe a 1930s art deco storefront or maybe a city block of intact historic homes. What we've done in the last 50 years is homogenize America into one big strip mall. And when people want to go on vacation and see old stuff, they want to go to Disneyland. 
why can't we restore our villages and cities and neighborhoods so there are things that people from other places might want to see? I think this is really important because a lot of times when people are considering a, a vinyl replacement in their home, they're not considering this message. How does that affect the neighborhood? How do the remodels that I'm doing now impact the characteristics of our entire community? And uh, that's what we, we hope to start the dialogue on um, through um, some events or at least some messaging and resources at a local level to, to help strike up conversation around this specific point. I think a lot of you out there, uh, whether you're an architect or a nonprofit, has heard this from one of your clients or people who are applying for a change in their home. They want to replace out their windows because the windows don't open. But many people don't know that they just need to scrape off the old paint. If they say that windows are energy inefficient, they don't know that a window that is well maintained, a historic window that is well maintained uh, and weather stripped is going to be even more efficient and last longer than any replacement window out there. Uh, replacement windows have seals that can fail uh, and have an expected lifetime of only 10 to 20 years. Take that in comparison with some of these windows that have been in the home for centuries. And you can see why we really wanna make sure the homeowner understands uh, what they're trying to change out. If they say their windows are broken, you know, there are options for repair. Uh, same thing with rotting. Uh, it doesn't mean that every single window in the home is always going to be uh, able to be saved, but it does mean that not every single window has to be replaced. There are options to mix and match. So it's all about education to your communities or your clients to make sure they, uh, that they know that there are many options out there available to them. And when I talked to a few different representatives from city groups, nonprofits, uh, and preservation professionals, I said, tell me of a city who you think has done a great job with their historic district regulations to balance out uh, what the community is asking for and what the historic district uh, really needs to put forth as standards. Uh, and I was told uh, Salem, Massachusetts a few times. So in their community, they have a requirement that if you would like to replace your windows, you need to come with the proposal of replacement along with the proposal of how much it would cost to just have them refurbished. And the intention is that they're not forcing them to always um, come to them with only the refurbishment request. You know, if they want to explore replacement, that's fine to bring forward to the committee, but they need to come with a full education and awareness of the options available to them. Uh, so I asked, well, how was this adopted? Did, did people react harshly to it? And there is often a time period where people get pushed back, but that happens anytime there's change. Um, it, it often takes just that period of awareness, making sure they understand that it's, it's in an effort to assist the community. And in the long run, people have really benefited from this. Uh, it's, it doesn't cost the homeowners uh, money to get an estimate just costs them a bit of time and in the end they often discover that the window rehabilitation is a less costly option than taking out all the windows in their home. So I think that the best way to educate the public is to have an event and in our presentation today, I'm going to go through several different examples that are easily approachable by either an organization or even if you're an architecture firm, a lot of times you have clients that might struggle with why this is important. And uh, I think that there can be a collaborative effort in between businesses and uh, nonprofits in order to make this happen. 
the window preservation component is one that I think is a good call to action, but it can also be an opportunity to spark discussions around larger preservation issues in your community. It's just that windows are often um, a hot button topic. And so I do think that the general response from the various organizations I interacted with said that they're often their most well attended event. Uh, and we also found a few instances where public policy was brought up during these lectures and afterwards there was actual change to public policy as a result of these events. Uh, so again, it can bring benefits from all sorts of different directions. Here's a couple quotes from the people I was working with uh, specific to that point. So Christine Dalton, who uh, will be speaking more about her experience with these uh, presentations, she's a city preservation officer down in Stanford, Florida. And she commented that these events have been able to influence city policies from tax abatement to funding uh, the historic rules, fund to funding to the historic rules. I also spoke with Allison Hardy, who I know has presented uh, here with Heritage Ohio. She's the founder of the uh, Window Preservation Alliance and also the owner of Window Woman of New England. And she commented, when you have a workshop, there are a range of skills of people who show up. You have 18 year olds to contractors to do it yourselfers. Out of that, one or two see that there's a business opportunity. So exposing them to the work and to the opportunity can help propel the momentum and uh, she's speaking to making sure you're continuing the opportunity for preservation trades uh, at a local level because the matter of fact is sometimes you can't find someone who is skilled in refurbishing your windows on a local area so why not create the opportunity for someone to start that uh, right there in your local area it's easy to do, we just need education and incentive. So the first step in your event is to have a goal. So window preservation is of course a goal, but we need to be more specific than that in order to uh, increase our chances of success. Here's a few uh, goals that are, are pretty common within these presentations that I've seen. So one is overcoming issues with resistance to historic district regulations. Maybe you have a lot of people in your community that they hear historic district and they get pretty grumbly because they just think that they lash out all these strict rules. So we wanna massage that and create an open dialogue that there's a reason why those rules are in place and really we're trying to help out the community. We also, uh, you could have a goal that you just wanna make window preservation, do it yourself and approachable. Uh, maybe it is something that would happen more frequently if uh, people in your community found that they could do the work themselves instead of hiring someone out if resources are in short supply. There are plenty of things that can be done on the window that really anyone can do with a little bit of training. And sometimes those more advanced projects are gonna need a professional uh, professional assistant, but with routine maintenance, uh, I think it is very attainable for each homeowner to take care of uh, the window preservation work in their own home. And then finally, your goal may be that you wanna just further the culture of preservation in your community and make it something that's important and a continuing dialogue throughout the year, uh, interacting your organization with uh, everyone who lives there. And whichever goal you choose here, you'll just want to make sure you echo that common theme throughout uh, the description and the title and the way that you market it. Uh, there's a picture here to the right, which is an example of that last goal of furthering the culture of preservation. So Christine Dalton put on several different lectures involving the window space, but I thought this was a nice example um, where she took Steve Quillian, who is the owner of Wood Window Makeover, as a guest speaker to their space. And because she already had uh, addressed the first two goals um, on this slide, he decided to make it more about culture. So he created this lecture called Transcendental Preservation, the Spiritual and Romantic Connection uh, to to historic preservation. And it's it's a really nice idea that it, it goes beyond this technical um, list of things that you can do to your space, 
but it becomes transcendental to your community uh, at the present and past and future. So uh, this is one great example of all the different ways that you can address this larger topic of window preservation. So once you have a goal, you got to be realistic on your resources. Uh, but the good news is there's a huge range that I've seen of successful window preservation events. Uh, on the low resources side, you can do a simple presentation. We'll be talking about each one of these today. Um, the, the middle ground with resources if, is if you have a guest speaker come in and give a lecture, um, it would still be in um, a space that would be for simple presentations, not necessarily a workshop. Uh, it gives a little bit more substance than uh, just anyone being able to do the presentation uh, and requires just a little bit more resources. And then if you want to go full out, you can have a hands-on workshop with a professional and uh, we'll be talking again uh, of examples of all three. Now, if you're an architect, um, I, I would highly suggest that you may be working collaboration um, or become a guest speaker uh, for, for one of these series yourself. So on that low resource end, you can have a simple presentation and I've actually created one in collaboration with a couple state historic preservation offices and uh, the Window Preservation Alliance. This presentation sets up the structure of why windows matter. It addresses some of the points that I covered earlier in this slide. Uh, and uh, it also points out a few different resources that you can use. I am fine with you chopping up this presentation, using it how you need, inserting your local rules and regulations into it. Um, and I'll give you a sneak peek right here. Um, so it's pretty cool. We do things like point out the problems with replacement windows sometimes, like the failed glass that I mentioned. We go into the anatomy of a window. We even have a link here to our Window Hero webinars, but also say, check out YouTube. It doesn't have to be through our site. Um, I, I try to be as impartial as possible. You'll notice that it's a similar looking template to the one that I'm showing you today, but I removed our logo. So it just says, save Ohio's historic windows right here. If you're tuning in from another state and would like um, a different background, just shoot me an email. I am happy to help customize any of this for you. Uh, and then the rest of the presentation walks through different repair examples and has some photos. So you can either go into detail as to how some of these are done or potentially even take out some of the slides that you're not really comfortable presenting. Uh, but the point of this presentation is to make the uh, items within it something that anyone could present whether you are a professional and you just need a quick outline to work from, or maybe you're a volunteer in an organization and you're ready to review this content and present it to a class in a simple free workshop to your community. This makes it approachable and uh, low in cost to get set up. Uh, so again, I'll send that out to uh, anyone who is interested. If you want to step up the game a little bit, we suggest bringing in a professional to do the lecture. And this is when I worked with Christine Dalton from Stanford, uh, Florida, on finding out what makes a successful event in this manner. So she gave me an example of when uh, she had Scott Seidler from Austin Historic, uh, who lives in Orlando, Florida, come out uh, to their city to host this lecture event. And it was sponsored by Historic Stanford Welcome Center and the Stanford Historic Trust. She commented that both of them really liked that it helped get their name out because it was on the flyer and uh, helped kind of create some awareness about their involvement in the community. But the actual lecture was just held in City Hall and Scott went over restoration, options for weatherizing and energy efficiency. He had some uh, samples there with him but it wasn't in a full window shop uh, workshop. It's not like there was a hands-on demo, but he could physically show some good examples 
of uh, what he was speaking to. And it was really powerful. Um, she has done many other lectures and uh, shared with me some of her tips for getting these things set up. So this whole concept uh, was fabricated by uh, Christine Dalton because she cared about it. She didn't have any budget. Uh, she went out and started this just because she believed in it and even took money out of her own pocket and her own time to get this off the ground. She went and asked for a snack donation of just $40 from one of the organizations. And she also reached out to a local bed and breakfast to see if they would be willing to put a speaker um, up for a night. So she got that donation. She took money out of her own pocket to take the speaker out to dinner and give them a red carpet tour of the town. And she would always ask for a speaker to come join them in the lecture series face to face. Uh, so she would go out to various preservation events that were statewide. And uh, she, she really made sure to point out that she didn't make this request over the phone because it helped her convey the value that she saw in this preservation series, established trust with the speaker, and made them uh, just really see that she wanted to ensure that all of these issues that were important to their community were being covered within the event, and the speaker was happy to do it with uh, just coming out and getting put up for a night. So she made this happen, got it off the ground, and she found that it created real excitement within her community. It was someone else saying that these issues were real and that they needed to be addressed. Uh, so she would kind of do a brief with them as well as, hey, look, these are some of the things that have been on our recent agenda. Could you possibly talk about it throughout the course of your lecture? And that's when public policy could really be influenced. Um, so again, this was just a great example of someone taking the initiative, uh, asking for uh, what they wanted and making it happen. Uh, Christine is happy to ask or answer any questions from you guys on uh, some tips and tricks for putting these events together. Uh, she might even be in the Q&A session a little bit later, but uh, her schedule has been pretty busy lately. The other example I wanted to show you is with a hands-on workshop. So this was up in Maine. This is kind of when you want to go full-blown. They had gotten a grant to preserve the windows in this uh, history center. And a private business was taking out the windows and uh, had a workshop uh, to put them back in. So it educated the community through a hands-on experience. And the best part was it was in a space that was being preserved. So they were welcome to come back to it and show their friends and family the, their craftsmanship and involvement in getting this done. So I love an idea like this. They funded it through both this grant and they charged uh, uh, tickets. And in order for you to be involved, it was $50, but that included the cost of lunch. Um, I've seen many other events like this take place, and uh, across the board, they seem to be very well attended. People like that hands-on interaction. So how do you market your event? Well, in at Indo here, we uh, think about what's called a funnel that people move through. They go through awareness, consideration, and a decision in order to take action. In this case, uh, the decision is going to be whether or not to preserve their windows. And this is how we might work through that dialogue. So in awareness, we're going to create doorknob hangers, put up signs, do social media postings, and you generally want a call to action. That's why the event is important, because it, because it gives you an end goal. It brings awareness to the issue, but there's something that they need to do, and there's a timeline that they need to achieve it in. So I think that's why that's important. Uh, I'll cover this a little bit later, but we're happy here at Indo to supply you with all sorts of cool things like buttons or these doorknob hangers to help spread a general awareness about why this should matter. Consideration is after they have discovered that 
they need to uh, dive into window preservation and they want to figure out what that really means. So that event is going to be key in order to supply them with those resources, but also consider doing blog posts, videos, reach out to your local media and see if they might be able to write an article on you. Um, and, and I point that out because it's not just posting about the event, but really sharing the resource about uh, why you as an organization are taking this issue on as something that's important to your community. Or if you're an architect, why is your firm caring about preservation? This is a good way for you to get the word about, out about the mission and values that your firm has towards the historic community. And then finally, there's the decision. Do I replace my windows? Do I go through a restoration project? How does your organization or company supply resources to your community or clients about this? There are plenty of resources out there. You can even go to the Window Preservation Alliance website and they have a whole list of journal articles, videos that can all be linked to from your website to help further uh, that communication. There's also a business directory on the WPA where you can find different window professionals that might either be able to assist you in um, your window preservation event or that you might want to list as someone uh, a homeowner can call on for assistance through the restoration process. And then finally, there's partnerships with business businesses, and Indo has launched an exciting new campaign that is working with historic nonprofits to donate 10% of uh, any order through these campaigns back to the nonprofit. And that will hopefully help further getting the word out about the importance and value of preservation within uh, your community. So let me tell you a little bit more about that now. So there's this landing page specific to Heritage Ohio. And uh, we created this because I think it's a great way for us to put some marketing funds toward getting the word out, provide you guys with the resources you need. Um, as shown in the last presentation, I think there is a balance between providing educational resources sources that are unbiased. So you'll see we do have a white paper out that explains about the value of the windows. And storms are a solution for the energy efficiency component. Um, and our goal is really to just make sure that they know uh, that there's lots of options out there other than window replacement. Uh, it's great if they find Indo to be a good solution, but it doesn't have to be the solution. Uh, and I do want to emphasize that. Let me show you though what the landing page looks like. So we have a white paper here, or sorry, <laughs> white paper is sales jargon. It's an article on why old, older windows matter and what you can do to make your window more efficient. Um, we created a product that is an interior window insert that is trackless. So most other storm systems you find out there are based on a square track and ours is compression fit, but it's also made for out of square windows. So uh, we're the only one on the market that has this unique process to make it fit right into the frame without any additional hardware and has it airtight. So it's really energy efficient. Um, I've really enjoyed working here because it's a product that I actually believe in. Um, and this page just provides a resource if that's an interesting option to them. Now, anyone who fills out this form on this landing page gets a special tag on our system that says, make sure that we donate 10% back to Heritage Ohio. Um, so this is a campaign that's already kicked off. If you go to the landing page um, a little bit later today, it's gonna look slightly different. We're modifying it visually just a little bit. Um, but uh, I, I'm really excited about this. And it's not just about this campaign where we're able to help you guys. Um, we'd love to help on your specific event. 
we have tons of resources available to you. As I said, we have these cute little buttons that say I heart window preservation. We also have ones that say window, uh, I'm a window hero with uh, all those little cartoon windows. We're happy to send you a little packet um, with those buttons, doorknob hangers, brochures. We also have a library on our website of all our Window Hero webinars, also available on our YouTube channels. Um, and all of those are guest speakers that it's not about know at all, it's strictly about window preservation. If you have other ideas for how we might be able to help uh, your business or organization, please reach out to us. Um, I am happy to carve out some time to figure out how we can attack these issues on a local level. And the WPA would love to help. I talked to Allison Hardy. She said, make sure to call us up if there's an event. We'll send you t-shirts, putty knives. Uh, they said they can even sponsor part of the event. It was funny, they said that they actually just had their first porta potty sponsorship, um, which, hey, if you need it, if it's something that makes the event happen, they're happy to pull some funds and throw it your way. Uh, the important part is that you get the resources you need in order to strike up these dialogues. They also have a mentorship program for anyone interested in the trades. Uh, so if you're a professional out there that wants to get involved, I encourage you to reach out to Allison uh, or the general org. And if you're an audience member that's interested in starting up your own business, I think the WPA uh, involvement is just vital for doing so. And finally, so you have this event, but it can't just be a one-off thing. Um, in marketing, we say that there are at least five times that you have to get something in front of someone in order for them to make a decision to purchase. Uh, it's the same thing here in the preservation space. You gotta continue repetition with this message. Um, and part of that is saying, okay, how am I going to determine success in my community to make sure that will happen? And how do I create a schedule for ensuring that I'm hitting all the checkpoints on my list? And most importantly, we need to consider a younger generation. It's not only what we're doing here today, but what we're gonna be setting in place for the future in order to make it as easy as possible for this to naturally evolve. And a big part of that is supporting young preservationist groups and encouraging younger members of your community to get involved in these workshops. Um, I know that Heritage Ohio has been really great with that, and um, so I'm probably preaching to the choir here, but <laughs> any time that you can uh, call out that younger generation is a great opportunity to make sure that tomorrow's efforts are, more e are, are made easier. So that's the bulk of the presentation. I'm happy to answer any questions. Uh, as well as send out that presentation that I mentioned. Um, and I'm very eager to hear what specific issues that you guys might be facing on a local level. Christina, that's great, great information. I can speak from firsthand knowledge with the uh, Window Preservation Alliance. They helped us out at our SASH mob in Cincinnati earlier this year, and Allison was great. Uh, not only for WPA supplying stuff for us to help us with our SASH mob event, but then also um, just Allison with the knowledge she has imparting that wisdom on our participants. I know it uh, made for an even better experience for them. And <clears throat> you mentioned about singing to the choir. Our Young Ohio Preservationists set up a window workshop. It was actually one of the first big events that they they did a couple years ago and uh, we are really blessed in Ohio to have some organizations, nonprofits, city representation of CLGs who are doing a great job of carrying that window message forward and um, we thank you for doing that. So uh, I also do just want to make a quick note that uh, for folks who are interested in our Heritage Ohio webinars, we do have a YouTube channel. And if you just go to youtube.com and search Heritage Ohio, you can go to our 
channel and you can check out prior webinars. We'll have this webinar posted. It's the um, audio and, and video, so the slides. So it's really great in case you uh, miss something or want to go back and check something else out. So um, I guess with that, what I will do is take a look at our questions. Um, it looks like we do have a question, uh, Michelle says, recent item came up in my city, dot, 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 lead windows. Any information slash white paper you know of that may help explain how lead windows aren't a danger to children? Mm. Yeah, I mean, we have a, a, a recent window here a webinar on um on lead safety because i know that can be a really challenging topic um and i'll, I'll show you here it was catherine brooks um you know the the leaded glass is not really the concern it, it's the lead in the paint that that you really need to be careful about um, um, and I think a lot of times the best way for you to approach the issue is to have a full conversation about it because there's so many different components. It's not just telling them about, uh, well, th this part about the lead is safe. It's going, let's look at the broad picture and how you can protect yourself as a homeowner against any lead paint uh, issues. So uh, it, it kind of goes back to that whole make an event or make some sort of resource with a professional to strike up that conversation and uh, detail out all the resources they might want to consider. Mm -hmm. that's, that's a great point because there um, you can have windows with lead paint on them that function perfectly well, but if you have a window and the lead paint is being abraded off or it's coming off and you're creating lead dust or you're creating those paint chips or paint dust on the floor and a kid is getting into that then that's at the point where it does become dangerous and you really do need um, that expert help about working lead safe because it uh, yeah certainly can be an issue mm -hmm. yeah that's a great question so um Curious uh, also, if you're on the webinar and you have done uh, windows, workshops, demonstrations, have had experts come in, uh, please let us know. And if you have anything scheduled coming up uh, end of this year or into 2018, please let us know. We are happy to um, try to do what we can to help promote it through our e-blasts um post stuff on our website uh we'll do what we can to help um help get the word out so um <clears throat> it looks like michelle had some follow-up when talking about the lead like in a stained glass window not paint and um i think christina you did allude to that that it's not actually like the lead um that that keeps together leaded glass panels unless you're chewing on on that lead it is not a danger in and of itself when it's just sitting there keeping the pieces of glass into place right um yeah exactly um and there there are some specific things too that are, are good to be aware about when you're working to preserve the the leaded glass windows um especially in churches and things like that which is again why i think it's great to involve a professional because it's just such a complex issue and i know that there's a lot of people um that are hesitant to provide too much detail on it because it's you don't want to say the wrong thing right so that's sure. also why i don't claim to be a professional on understanding all the issues around lead but it is a very important one to address and make sure that your community has the right resources and knowledge around it mm -hmm. i see a note from donna hey donna in cambridge uh you're interested in doing a windows workshop in 2018 we'll make sure to get you a copy of the presentation okay Awesome. Yeah, I'll definitely uh, get that your way. Um, Gloria 
asks, what about heavy metal casement windows in my church that will not open? Uh, how to repair and preserve part of the building built in 1928, other parts of the building date from 1959 and 1964. Mm, yeah, those can be pretty tricky. Um, and there are people that specialize in steel windows. Uh, I know Jim Turner is actually one that, um, oh, I thought that he was listed right here, but I guess not. Oh yeah, there he goes. Um, no, he works in steel windows. Um, he's out in Michigan, so not too far away from you. Um, but he actually, I think, has some good resources closer to you of specialists who might be able to help um, with that particular work. Um, a, a lot of it is just understanding the anatomy of the window and determining where the window is failing. It could potentially be some hardware that just needs to be replaced. Um, but it's just having someone come out and take a look and uh, problem solving where the repair can happen. Um, like I said, sometimes it's just a matter of switching out some hardware and the window can continue to operate. Um, and then it just needs some weather stripping and it can actually be made uh, pretty comfortable again. Great. And uh, Gloria, Jim was our lead um, workshop presenter for our sash mob in Cincinnati. And he spends a lot of time in Louisville. And um, if you email me fquinn at heritageohio.org, I could send along his contact information and maybe he would be able to set up something with you. Um, we could look at um, maybe getting him up to as uh, Christina says, to be able to take a look and see what you have. So, um, Christina, the last two houses I've lived in have both had exterior storm windows. So I am kind of wondering about the whole interior storm window versus exterior storm window. What's, what, what are the pros and cons? Because I'm sure you must get that question a lot. Yeah, um, well, I would say that a lot of people who have the exterior storms already came with the home. So uh, sometimes they're even painted to match the home, so they don't want to lose those, but they're not really providing any additional insulation value. Um, or it, it's providing some insulation, but no air sealing, uh, because they weren't designed to be airtight. They were made largely to just provide an extra blanket on the window, um, and potentially to protect uh, the exterior. But the downside is that it does change the look from the outside and it, the room still can be pretty cold even with the, the exterior storms in place. Um, then once you get into your second story exterior storms, it becomes more difficult to change in and out seasonally. So that's where the interior storms started coming into the market. Uh, now the downside of some of the interior storms is not all of them are airtight. So there is often condensation issues that can exist. And when our founder, Sam Pardew, came up with this product, he lived in an older home and realized those issues and realized that we could get around the condensation, overcome it, by making the window really airtight. Um, it's a challenge because most windows are out of square. About 95% of the inserts we make are to pretty out of square, square windows. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, that measurement process is one that we had to develop. Um, what we did actually is we take measurements on the diagonals, um, as opposed to just the width and height on different places of the window. What this does is give us four triangles so we can construct the actual shape of the window and custom make each window insert to that opening. So the air seal can help eliminate condensation, gives much uh, better uh, energy efficiency to the home, 
and it can even reduce noise, which is uh, pretty great in the cities that are developing a lot and getting increased traffic noise. Is there, um, is there such a thing as an opening that's too big for an interior insert? There are usually openings that um, can start really pushing the limits there. And so then you have to do things like have a mullion division mm -hmm. where you break it up into a few different panels. Um, so we have, I'll, I'll try and show you an example here. I'm talk, talking, um, but we have these mullion divisions that allow us to break up the window into a few different sections. Um, and at that point, we can just do any size, really. Um, so here you can see we have these little H bars uh, that get installed into the frame. And so we can do all sorts of sizes and configurations. That's usually how you can overcome the challenge. Um, but you're probably going to run into that with exterior storms as well uh, after you get past a certain size. For us, we can do five foot by 10 foot or six foot by eight foot. So oh, okay. realistically, we can do most residential spaces without an issue. Uh, it's when we get to those commercial huge windows that sometimes we have to come up with uh, some creative solutions. Mm -hmm. Okay, good. That's good to know. Are there any other questions for our attendees? I'll give folks a few seconds. I'm not sure if we have anyone uh, joining us today who is also going to be in Chicago next week for the National Trust Conference, but Christina, um, would you like to promote <laughs> an event coming up? Sure. Yeah, um, I would really love to speak with any of you who are coming out to the National Trust. We'll have a booth there at the exhibit hall, so please come and say hi, um, and I'd be happy to give you some buttons or whatever you need, talk about your next event, uh, or just uh, introduce ourselves and make sure that uh, I can be there for any of your future needs. And we also have a fun party that's going to take place on Wednesday. So it's at a, a venue called Celeste, which is in a historic 1888 Chicago building that was um, originally a, a Adolph and, or sorry, Sullivan building that uh, underwent a fire at one point and has been uh, remodeled, so some really cool history, distinctive Chicago architecture, and we'll have some food and drink to kick off the conference. So um, if you're interested in coming, uh, I have this web page here where you can RSVP. It's just go.endowindows.com slash nthp2017 dash after party. Great. Sounds like fun. That is now that has passed my bedtime, but I am still going to try to make it. <laughs> yeah, we have a long conference ahead of us, but got to slip in some time uh, to experience Chicago nightlife, too. So, OK. All right. I'm, for I'm sure. looking to nerd out on preservation, so it, it's a pretty good combination. <laughs> That sounds great. Uh, hey, Christina, I really appreciate you joining us today. And uh, I also appreciate all of our attendees joining us today. And uh, as I mentioned, our webinars are available on YouTube. We will have our next webinar in December. I wish I had better information in front of me, but I know it's going to be a great topic. So um, with that, I will sign off. And I uh, hope you have a great day in preservation and revitalization across the state and across the country. Thanks a lot, folks.